Welcome everyone to a conversation about Great Lakes ice. Ice is certainly really pretty to look at in the wintertime here in Chicago and across the Great Lakes, but there's a lot of information about ice that I think is kind of uh, interesting. And so joining me today is a, a physical scientist with NOAA. James Kessler is his name. He's with the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. And, and James has a, an atmospheric science master's degree from the University of Michigan, and also an engineering degree in earth science, uh, earth system science rather from the University of Michigan. And he's also authored some really interesting papers on Great Lakes ice and how ice has changed over the past few decades. So James, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So let's just get right into it because we're recording this here on February 11th and uh, it's the coldest we've been all winter and really it's the coldest we're going to be this winter after a relatively mild start. So how has the ice changed on the lakes over the past month or so? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at, if you wanna look at, uh, you know, spatial fields at, I at ice, um, sort of what you would see from a satellite, um, actually have those figures prepared so you can see what we looked like on, on January 10th, um, one month ago today. Um, Lake Michigan itself was about 2% covered with ice. Uh, the Great Lakes were, were also, you know, the Great Lakes as a whole were about 2% covered. Um, so this figure here shows ice, ice cover, um, the, you know, the, the yellow color, the more yellow um, is higher ice cover and the more purple is lower. And let me ask you too, on January 10th, how does that compare to say the long-term average? So it was, um, it was, it was below certainly, but below the average. Um, I've got some, some other figures that I can show too, um, that might be helpful in answering that question. But, um, there was a portion of January, um, for maybe a week or so that we were actually lower than, um, that week was, had lower ice cover than, uh, any prior, um, year for that week, uh, on record. And our records do go back about, um, five decades. So that was pretty significant. Okay, so there's January 10th, and then here's one month later. Uh, this is February 10th, and it's it's quite a substantial difference. Yeah, absolutely. So you see there, Lake Michigan, you know, was at two percent uh, a month ago, and now it's up to eighteen percent. Um, the Great Lakes even higher, twenty four percent. You can see significant ice grow, growth in uh, Lake Erie. Um, it's shot up uh, to to around eighty percent just over the last couple of days. Um, and you're definitely seeing the impact of, you know, this cold air that we're seeing. So, you know, with the ice growth we've seen over the past month, and it, it's certainly obviously such a, a gorgeous sight to look at here from Chicago out over the lake and seeing the ice form. But um, let's talk about some of the benefits of the ice coverage on the Great Lakes, the ecological benefits and some other positives of ice on the lakes. So there's definitely definitely a number of um, just impacts in general of ice cover. Um, so there's economic impacts. Um, commercial shipping is actually you know a multi-billion dollar industry in the Great Lakes, uh, and ice cover inhibits uh, shipping. So um, the U.S. Coast Guard is actually tasked with um, breaking breaking waterways for these um, you know freighters to get through the lakes. Um, and when when we have high ice years, really high ice years, um, it actually you know shuts down this industry. Uh, so in 2014 and 2015, um, some steel plants actually had to temporarily close because the ice was so high. Um, so that's sort of a, a negative impact of high ice cover. Um, on the other hand, um, there's lots of, as most people are aware, you know, tourism and recreation that happens on the lakes. Um, you know, ice skating, ice fishing, uh, snowmobiling, cross country skiing. Um, so uh, you know, when there's low ice cover, these activities can't take place, or um, more importantly, they can't take place safely. Um, so there are, you know, instances where folks assume that it's safe to go on the ice sort of because of the time of year it is. Um, but we have this great interannual variability from, you know, one year to the next with ice cover. Um, so it's it's really hard to know when it is safe to go on the lakes. Um, from an ecologic, e ecologic point of view, um, there are uh, certain species of fish that actually, you know, depend on the ice um, for their spawning process, whether it's be laying, on, laying the eggs underneath the ice. Um, and certain microorganisms actually, you know, depend on the, depend on the ice cover. And these microorganisms are, you know, the basis for the food web in the Great Lakes. So if there's no ice, you know, it really it really hurts the the numbers of these species. Um, and then for you know us humans on the land, um, there are impacts of ice cover from you know lake effect snow. Um, when the lakes totally freeze over, there's no um, you know moisture source source for the atmosphere to have lake effect snow. 
Um, so when there's lower ice cover that sets up the conditions for lake effect snow, obviously that doesn't guarantee that it's going to happen. You still need the atmosphere to play ball. Um, and then there's also impacts to, um, to, to coastal erosion. Um, so when we have these strong winter storms, um, the, the ice cover that's along the shore actually acts to like dampen the waves that are coming towards the shore. Um, and when there's no ice cover, uh, you know, there's no damping. So the, the big waves are able to get to the shoreline. Um, and as a lot of people are aware, the, the water levels in the Great Lakes are quite high, um, you know, over the past couple of years. So this is a sort of a dicey combination um, if you have, you know, high water levels and, and, and you know, not protected shoreline as well. Yeah. And, and let's just talk about that real quick about the, the fact that the, the lake levels are at historic highs over the past couple of years on, on most of the lakes. And how has ice impacted the lake levels? Is there a correlation there? Yeah, so it's it's a really um, it's a really interesting but really complicated interaction between um, ice cover and water levels. Um, as as you know, water evaporates from the lake surface, um, the lake surface cools, and it's going to be um, you know more more likely, I guess, more likely to freeze as it cools. Of course, um, once there is ice cover, that's going to prevent evaporation from happening. Um, so there's this sort of like cause and effect sort of chicken and egg relationship between uh, water levels and ice cover. And it's, um, it's really an active area of research. So it's hard to, it's hard to really like sum it up in, in you know, a simple explanation because it really is complicated. Yeah. Um, but they, they certainly are related. That's the thing about the lake level uh, levels, because it really is complicated considering, you know, 2013, we were at record low levels for Lake Michigan. And in the past, you know, just seven years, it shot up to almost record high levels. So in, in, in that time span of seven years, we had such great fluctuations and ice levels too on Lake Michigan. So if you're right, it's a real complicated explanation as to why and how lake levels change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, interesting. Okay, you've got another graphic here I want to share, um, which I found interesting as well. Uh, I'll pull it up. So what we're seeing here is uh, sort of the seasonal um, the seasonal cycle of ice cover, um, and this is for all the Great Lakes, um, sort of as an average. Um, so the the x-axis here is you know time, and you can see the month printed down there, um, and then the y-axis is the the percentage of ice cover, so the you know the total coverage of the Great Lakes. Um, so the black line is what we've seen so far for 2021, um, and then the the red line is the sort of the long-term average. And then if you look, um, the really faint lines in the past are Sorry, the really faint lines are past years. Um, so you can see sort of uh, gives you some perspective of this big variability that we have from one year to the next. Um, so you'd ask about sort of what had, what had happened in January. So you can see there's actually some part, some part of January sort of towards the end um, where the black line is lower than uh, any of the other blue lines, meaning that for that time of year, um, based on our you know, five decades of ice cover, um, it's never been that low for that time of year. Um, thanks, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so that's definitely pretty, um, you know, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, it's not terribly significant since it was for a shorter, um, you know, a short period of time. Uh, but th the entire month of January actually ranked second lowest. Um, and I'll show a figure that um, that describes that in a minute. Um, but it's hard to, you know, it's hard to to not address the fact that ice cover has gone up significantly from then. Um, so we sort of see this first peak right right going into to February. Um, as the lake started to freeze. Um, and then with this cold weather, you see the, you know, the lakes respond and a significant increase as well. Um, I will point out still below average, um, but much more in sort of the envelope of what's normal. Um, you know, you can see from the, the past years, like, you know, how it compares, um, but, but still, still below normal. Um, and then I think the, another good thing to, to point out is um, when we, when we talk about this, you know, large data set that spans, you know, it goes back to 1973. Um, uh, we use the annual maximum ice cover as sort of this index to describe what a what a year was, and that's basically you know what it sounds like. It's the the max ice cover and percentage uh, for a given year. Um, so you can see just based on this chart, you know the the red line sort of peaks towards the end of February, early March. Um, so it's still it's still a little early to to sort of define this ice season, um, even though it's you know it's February 11th today. It seems like the winter has been here, you know, and it's. We're almost getting ready for spring. It's it still is um, 
a little early to really to really call this ice year for what it is. It's really interesting because you know water takes longer to to heat up and to cool down. So there's always that delayed factor with water temperatures as we go through the winter and even in the summertime. You know, and I always like to say going to a Cubs game in April is like you still bring your winter gear because that wind comes in off the lake and it gets real cold fast. Absolutely. Yeah. So your next slide here, um, this one is the annual ice coverage, as you were talking about the max, is this the max ice coverage for each year? So this is, um, this is for the entire, it's average for the entire month of January. Um, so not, not actually the maximum, just the, the, um, and this is for the Great Lakes specifically. Um, so for, for all of, all of the lakes together. Um, so you can see 2021 is highlighted in green there. Um, so it was second lowest and it was just, just below or just above um, 2002. Um, and then I'll also point out, um, it's sort of interesting to note that um, six of the 10 lowest, actually, yeah, there you go, perfect. Uh, six of the 10 lowest Januarys have occurred during the past decade. Um, so that's fairly remarkable for, you know, a, a almost 50 year um, data set that we have. But then I'll also point out 2014 was fourth highest for, for Januarys. Um, so that's, you know, that really speaks to this interannual variability, um, you know, these big fluctuations from one year to the next. Yeah. And as you mentioned, we have the data back to 1973. So it's a pretty decent data set that we have. And so this here is uh, the max. Uh, you, you helped me explain. This is the max for each year for the entire Great Lakes? Correct. So yeah, so like I was just, like I was mentioning before, it's that annual maximum ice cover. So you know the, the peak value of the percentage for, for each given year. Um, and you can see how, how wildly this um, this uh, oscillates if you want to think of it that way. Um, so the long-term average for this maximum is about 53%. You can see that red line there. Um, but you can see there, there aren't a lot of years that are actually near that average. Um, we have a lot of really high ice years uh, and a really, uh, you know, a number of low ice years. Um, and you can, you can see in the last, in that last decade, you know, we've had extreme highs and extreme lows. Yeah, it's really interesting because you, when, you, when you look for averages in something, you try to find the baseline and then you get these wild swings and the average oftentimes never happens because it's either a lot or a little bit uh, in a case like this with the ice. Exactly. So the, this next graphic uh, is, explain this one to me because I'm seeing a bunch of blues and some tan uh, bar lines. Sure. Here. Yeah, so it's it's a little it's a little difficult to look at. Um, it's not super intuitive, um, but basically what we're seeing is the seasonal cycle um, sort of stacked up by year. Um, so once the lakes are above 10% frozen, um, and the, you see the y-axis here is, you know, months. So starting in, you know, December going through April. So, uh, you know, time, time is going up for each year, basically. So once the lakes are above 10% frozen, um, you get that sort of, you know, that tan color. Uh, once they're above 25% light blue and so on to 50%. Um, so this just sort of shows, um, how, how ice cover um, evolves through the season. Uh, it tells us, you know, sort of about the duration. You can see the duration of the ice season um, and also the timing um, because, it all, you know, it, it shows you, uh, you know, if you look at 2020 um, this year, you can see that that tan, the tan line didn't start, you know, until almost into February. Um, and like I said, that was second lowest January on record. So if you look back, um, you can see that, you know, typically by this time of year, um, you know, you would see, you would see higher ice cover. Um, and yeah, this is just to point out that, you know, this season is not done yet. And you can see, uh, if you look in past years, there's a lot of, uh, you know, darker blues um, ahead. Uh, so, you know, potentially we still could see high ice cover this year. Um, it's possible we just sort of got a late start. And I think one of the things that stands out uh, by looking at this chart is first off 2014, which is this year here with this pretty uh, long time frame with greater than 50% ice coverage. That yeah. kind of stands out to you. The other thing that kind of stands out too is you look back in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot more time frame where we had 50% or greater ice coverage on the lake. And you know, in the past 20 years, there just isn't as much dark blue on the on this chart. Absolutely. And and so what are some of the theories behind why this is happening? Sure. Um so, I mean, one thing we can do just to uh, sort of quantify the fact that it is happening, um, you know, is look at is look at trends. Um, so, if we use that annual and maximum ice cover 
um, that I discussed as sort of, you know, this index, and you just try and, you know, uh, fit a line to, to that data through time, um, we, can, we can see that it is decreasing. Um, so that's showing that that maximum ice cover is going down through time. So they're decreasing at a, at a rate of about 5% per decade, um, and that's 5% ice cover, um, not, um, you know, when, when people say something's decreased by 50%, they mean it's half of what it was. I mean, you know, an absolute less ice cover um, per decade. Um, so that's, I mean, that's fairly significant. Um, you can see sort of the trend, the trend um, shown there of, of this max ice cover through time. Um, and it's, it's surprising to see this, right? Because we do have those years like 2014 and 2015 were also quite high. Um, so it's surprising to see that there is still this significant trend downward. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a way to sort of, uh, like I said, quantify that there is this change um, in regards to maximum ice cover. Um, you can also look at things like the, you know, the ice season duration, like you mentioned, um, and, and try to sort of quantify it that way. Um, so kind of so some I mean, ways would be it's less ice coverage on the Great Lakes in the past uh, since 1973 or in the past at least decade to two decades and less ice duration. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, looking, you know, looking at the graph sort of qualitatively, um, it, it certainly appears to be the case. Um, and quantitatively, by looking at the trend for the max ice cover, I would, yeah, I would say that that's that's accurate. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and you you talk about you know you you originally sort of asked about you know theories for sort of why you know the drivers for why this is happening, um, uh, so so one thing uh, one sort of active area of research um, is looking at uh, global teleconnections um, and most people aren't familiar with teleconnections but they're familiar with El Nino, um, which is just one of many teleconnections. Um, so these different teleconnections are really like global uh, sort of weather patterns um, and they're measured by sea surface temperature or surface pressure anomaly. Um, and they largely like dictate um, the the source of the air mass that reaches the Great Lakes as weather systems move across the continental U.S. Um, so, so we can we can look at these teleconnections and try and see see what's happening, and that helps um, you know helps inform predictions um, of what this season is going to be like or what future seasons are going to be like. Um, and outside of outside of that, I mean, it's it's fairly intuitive. You you can assume that you know the the primary things that that drive ice cover are, you know, air temperature and water temperature. Um, and obviously there's a, a relationship there where, you know, the air temperature um, impacts the water temperature, right? Um, so, I mean, we've seen we've seen air temperatures in the Great Lakes increase um, over the same period of time. Um, we've also seen water temperatures increase over the same period of time. Um, so it's not it's not too shocking that ice cover is uh, decreasing over time. Yeah. Yeah. I found that interesting, too, about the water temperatures, because um, the the increase in water temperatures uh, have been kind of a, an interesting phenomenon too because you look at like the southern Lake Michigan buoy over the past couple of years that's got up to about 80 degrees at times which is you know that's like Gulf of Mexico water um, just the the change in water temperatures and you know the ice coverage has an impact on water temperatures in the summertime too right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the lakes have great memory, if you want to think about it that way. Um, they're very deep, um, so they store, you know, a lot of heat, um, really, you know, especially when you consider a lake like Lake Superior, um, you know, it's it's very possible that, you know, it has years worth of memory um, to sort of stretch the word a little bit. Um, and you mentioned, so you mentioned the Lake Michigan buoy. Um, so I just, I just, I guess I'd point out too, uh, to, to keep an eye out for um, maybe for your own uh, personal interest. Um, we actually like. It's, I'm not. I'm not a co-author, but some of my colleagues have a paper um, that's in review right now, um, and it's looking at uh, the uh, the thermistor string actually that's co-located at that buoy. Um, so it really dives into um, you know temperature changes throughout time, throughout depth. Um, so it's it's really interesting. There's been a you know a lot of focus on. Um, observing, you know, air temperature changes globally and lake temperature changes globally, uh, as well as oceans, obviously. Um, lakes tend to be uh, on a par with uh, the air temperatures, actually, which are, you know, is a greater change. But most of this focus has been on um, lake surface temperature, um, because that's the data that's available, um, and a specific focus during the summertime. Um, so this new, this new paper actually will focus on, you know, year-round changes um, and what's going on below the surface. Um, so it really, it really paints a, a 
a better picture of um, of what's going on and ask a lot of questions since this is really sort of unique data set that we um, that we can leverage. Yeah. Oh, that'll be interesting because just talk to talk to us about you know how the lake operates because obviously the very top level or layer of the lake is where temperatures change and you get to a certain point and it's a pretty consistent temperature all the way down to the bottom. Sure. Um, so right. So I mean the only the only uh, real mechanism for the the lake to exchange heat with the atmosphere is at the surface um, and then um, that that heat within the lake is mostly um, driven by it's most of that heat is distributed mostly by by mixing um, because obviously the water is a fluid and it can mix um, so you have different cycles throughout the year um, where the lakes you know the upper layer of the lakes are, you know is heated and it's sort of separate kept separate from the lower part of the lake um, and then you get spring overturn and everything mixes um, and then you have sort of constant temperature throughout the lake um, and then this this sort of happens again in the fall um, so yeah so it's really a sort of interesting dynamic yeah I, I have to ask you what's your favorite part about studying great lakes ice um j just off the top of my head like you know watching watching the the changes um in the ice charts you know you can you can stack a bunch of images uh you know over the course of a week or a season um and you can you can watch the ice grow and sort of decay um it's just it's really it's really fascinating to look at do you ever just go to the shoreline there I, I, you're in michigan right now do you ever just go to the shoreline and just sit there and stare at the ice so i'm i mean i'm a ways i'm in ann arbor so i'm kind of a ways from any shoreline um but i mean i vacation in the upper peninsula um I've, I've actually got some great photos of uh being on lake superior's ice um maybe about two and a half years ago or so um some some brash ice where a bunch of ice sort of stacks up on itself um, towards the shoreline. So I'm, I'm standing next to this massive pile of ice. That's probably three times my height. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great to get out there when I, there, when I get a there, chance. There really are some wild ice formations on, on the lakes, you know, you got ice volcanoes, ice shards, ice shoves, ice balls. And so it's just a fascinating thing to look at at all, how, how the ice gets sculpted by the lake. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, James Kessler, thank you so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate your time. And uh, James is with the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. I appreciate you hopping on and joining us today, James. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much, Larry. It's really, it's really great to get this information out there. Great. Thank you.